And we're live. Sayed, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. And I'm looking forward to this because uh, I know we have a lot to talk about in terms of your field of work that I think is going to be really valuable for everybody. And I have some interesting questions on it myself. Also, uh, on the business side of things, I really want to ask you some questions uh, that I think will be valuable to anybody, whether they're younger and just wanting to get into uh, their field of choice, whether they're seasoned entrepreneurs and business owners with your experience. I think there's a lot to be said today. So I'll let you uh, tell us a bit more about who you are, what you do, and then we'll go from there. Sounds great. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm Sayed Abbas Musabi. I am a physician uh, practicing in Michigan and um, has some affiliations here in Windsor, Ontario. Um, I have been in practice since 2010 and um, I specialize in interventional pain, uh, sports medicine, um, and uh, more recently, um, regenerative medicine or orthobiologics, as we call it now. We talk about PRP and stem cell therapies. Got it. That's awesome. And uh, I love the new transition to uh, regenerative medicine and everything that you're working on nowadays. I want to ask you about all of, all of that. Uh, but first things first, if you don't mind sure. just highlighting how you looked at this area of medicine or your field of choice and how you decided to pursue this uh, in the first place, I would love to hear the backstory because I don't think I'm familiar yet. No. So, so, you know, I've always wanted to go into medicine. Um, it's, uh, you know, from the time I was in high school, um, you know, going into medicine, you, most of us have some type of idea of what we want to pursue in terms of specialty. So from the get go, I was really interested in radiology, looking at imaging and, and, and so on. But when, you know, actually, when I went through the clinical aspect of my uh, medical school, I realized that, um, you know, my place is more of an interactive type person. I like to talk to patients and, you know, examination, et cetera. And, and I came upon what I do now, which is physical medicine, rehabilitation, you know, interventional pain management, sports medicine, kind of all, all within one uh, specialty. Um, and so it, it took me a little while to realize that radiology wasn't for me. And I think that's what a lot of physicians tend to do is they have a goal um, and then when they pursue what they um, what they uh, what they do in, in, in their last final years of medical school and they realize that maybe that's not the right position for them. So for me, it was it was more or less the patient interaction. And uh, not, only, not only that, I mean, thinking about kind of the business model perspective is from a from a radiologist perspective versus what I do. Um, there's a lot more um, uh, variability and 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 business model type setups for the specialty I work in rather than uh, radiology. So, uh, you know, it was, it was multifaceted reason as to why I decided to pursue um, my specialty and, and more so because of patient interaction, but also because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more opportunity. Got it. Yeah, I think that's a really good reason to pivot. And uh, it seems like it's a common thing that, you know, people in your field get to the area that they studied and wanted to specialize in and then it may not have been all that it was made out to be, or it may not have been what they're super passionate about. But I would assume just like the entrepreneurship space, most people won't take the extra risk to pivot or to uh, really pursue what they want to pursue or to continue their growth uh, like you have with your clinics and everything you do. I don't know how accurate that is, but I feel like not everybody is uh, like yourself and willing to pivot and willing to recreate themselves. That's that's absolutely correct. I think the the... The notion of uh, physicians um, not understanding, um, you know, the business aspect or the entrepreneurship model of the of this career has been changing. I think in the last few decades, um, and I think more so now than before, because um, you know our prior uh, focus was clinical medicine and and care, and and I and I think we can we we can still maintain that, but at the same time, um, you know have a nice foundation. I call it a good foundation for our, from a business standpoint, because at the end of the day, I mean, if you're married, you have children, you have a future, you have to think about retirement and so on. So, uh, so I think, I think one thing that I, I believe is really lacking and, and I hopefully will start changing sooner rather than later is during the medical program, there is really isn't a lot of education on this aspect of the practice of the career of, you know, Yes, you can go out there and be a very good physician, but how can you survive from a financial point of view 
um, with the cuts in them. In, in, in our case, because, you know, in the U.S., we have a lot of different variabilities when it comes to insurance reimbursement. It changes every year. So it, and it's going less and less and less. Um, and so we have to think about that. Ontario, obviously, we don't have to think about that as much, but still the compensation or the reimbursements are, are less than they are, even comparatively speaking, than the U.S. So they still have to keep that in mind. Um, but, uh, but I think there, there's more awareness now. And, um, and, and I've been, you know, happy to speak about that with a lot of my colleagues who come to us and, you know, want to have conversations, open conversations about how do, how do I diversify myself rather than going to clinic nine to five, you know? Mm -hmm. and so. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you about the diversification as well. And everything you do on the business side, it seems like you get into this field thinking you're only going to practice what you do best in your medicine and all of that and help people from that perspective. But then you soon realize there's a business element to all of this as well. And you actually have to be business savvy as well and know how to make decisions and how to expand and how to sustain yourself so that you could continue to scale and help more people. Now, going back to uh, your area of expertise, so you mentioned pain management and then pivoting into regenerative medicine and PRP and stem cells and everything that you do nowadays. What have you seen that is, you could say, most impactful in terms of uh, handling some of the issues that you see in your patients, whether it's pain related issues, whether it's uh, PRP or stem cell related issues? I mean, which area are you most, uh, I guess you could say, optimistic about or passionate about nowadays? So one one of the biggest things I've noticed in the last many years now is uh, patients come to us with a plan in mind. So it's like going to a store and you understand that you, what you want to buy, you're going in there to buy that thing. And if you don't get it, you're going to go to another store to get it. So, so I see in the last, you know, probably five to seven years of at least my practice, that patients would come to me and ask me about different treatment options. And at that time, we weren't really offering them. And so it really kind of opened my eyes to patients are, are educating themselves as a consumer. And they're saying, listen, I want this. I, you know, For example, when, when I talk about regenerative medicine, we talk about it as an alternative to a surgery. For, you know, so someone who comes in with chronic knee pain and, and they were told they need knee surgery, but they want to try stem cell therapy. And so they come to us. And so I think the awareness and education of, of, I mean, some would call it Dr. Google or whatever the case is, is, is much higher than it was before. So, so to meet that demand, we, ha I mean, we had to, had to diversify our, um, areas of practice, um, and not have a kind of a, a straight linear path. Um, and I think that's a big, big root behind, you know, why we made many changes. Cause I think the patients are just much more aware. Um, and the questions they come with, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting with, you know, studies and they read this stuff and, and, uh, and we got to keep up with it. I mean, the whole parental kind of, you know, model of, you know, patient will listen to what we say is, is not no longer present because they come with this education. So, so to, to be able to keep up with it, um, we had to really, um, kind of expand our service model and our service, you know, uh, options. Yeah. So I think, first of all, that's very true. I definitely agree with you because uh, I'm one of those individuals myself who has uh, handpicked a few of the so-called, you know, experts or researchers or scientists and tunes into their work and is constantly updating myself and I'm constantly learning and evolving. And anytime mm -hmm. I've gone in and done uh, any type of testing, whether it's, you know, DNA related testing or recently I did the Dutch test as well, just to see some of my levels and all of that. Uh, yeah. I'm very aware of what I'm looking at as well. So when I'm speaking to uh, whether it's a doctor or a naturopath or whoever it might be, I'm also aware of the dynamic and what's happening. So you're mm -hmm. absolutely right there. But I'm curious to know, what do you think of that from your perspective? You know, being the medical expert who, you know, it didn't used to be like that, where, you know, patients would pretty much be strictly listening to your advice and following suit. But now, you know, patients come with their own opinions, with their own ideas and some of it could be great because it's accurate and they're on top of their own health. Some of it may be misguided or they may not have the full data. I mean, from a medical expert's perspective, uh, how do you guys perceive this? It can go both ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, case in point, I had a patient the other day that came to me and said, I want spine uh, stem cell treatment, which we do quite a bit of. Uh, yet he hadn't pursued some of the more traditional treatments, but he came with that in mind. And it took me about two, you know a couple of visits with him to number one, establish that, okay, he has other options. Um, but 
the, after the third visit, it, it, the, the conversation kept revolving back to the same, I'm here and I want to get my spine treatment with regenerative medicine. So I, I mean, for lack of better words, I, I gave into it. I said, you know, if you, this is what you truly want, it, my, my medical opinion and my medical advice is really geared towards what I feel is not just best for you, but maybe most appropriate for you. But if you want to come in and say, listen, I want to, I want to, uh, pay for this treatment because it's not covered under insurance and I want it done. I understand the science behind it. I understand. I think that kind of opened my eyes that that little encounter that I had with this patient over the, over the course of the last few weeks that, you know, if a patient comes in and they understand that, you know, this is a treatment they want and there's no harm for them, meaning it's not going to adversely impact them if we do it. It's, like I said, it's kind of giving that same model of, of when you walk into a store, you know what you want. You're going to get that. If you don't get it from that store, you're going to go somewhere else. It's the same idea with him. And and so I think that from the perspective of a clinician, unless it's absolutely not appropriate for a patient, but they come in understanding and knowing what they really, really want, I, I think that it's appropriate to really hear them out and, and a, as a business owner and, and, and as versus, you know, interacting with the consumer, I think that's very important. Um, and I think that ideology has really changed also over the, the last number of years with, with the, within our specialty, because before, you know, you, you know, the attitude was, you know, we know better, you know, we're the ones that studied for 10, 12 years and et cetera, and trained and, who are you to come in and, and you know, demand this? And But it really isn't a demand. It's their body. They understand what their problem is. And they want to know that if it's appropriate, can we do this? So I think that that's changed our mentality quite a bit. So my, my model now is, you know, when I see a patient, whether it's for regenerative medicine, whether it's for traditional pain uh, treatments that we do, I, I, I have open ears. I hear them out. And as long as it makes sense and the clinical diagnosis makes sense with what they're looking for from a consumer slash patient perspective, I, I, you know, it, it, it can, it can be done. That model can work. And, and then you get patient satisfaction. And even if it doesn't work, in other words, even if it doesn't have the outcome they expect, at least there was an informed decision that we provide them and that they know that they chose to make this decision rather than us saying this is what you should do so it, it in, in two perspectives is actually beneficial because nothing we do is perfect right i mean the, we're, we're you know we're not we don't have the hand of you know a miracle we what we do is we we do our best based on what the uh, options are for a patient but if someone comes in saying this is what i think i i really i read up on this, this is what i like and I agree to it and it makes sense to me clinically, at least even the patient knows that if it doesn't work, then at least, you know what, it was something that we informed and made together rather than me saying this is what you should do. So I think it's really changed that outlook from a clinician's perspective. Um, and then uh, and then obviously it changes the whole business model, I think, from a from a clinic, you know, and how you operate and how an organization operates. Yeah, I think so, too. And I'm really glad to hear your take on this. I feel like your yeah. Amongst the, you could say, younger generation of, uh, you know, people in your field or in the medical establishment as, as a whole, and it seems like uh, you're very much open minded to this approach. It feels almost like a team approach where both sides are approaching the problem together, where the patient is bringing their thoughts, their mm -hmm. you know, ideas, what they feel they may want, and then you're bringing your expertise and doing the consultation in a way that uh, you're providing all the information necessary for them to make an educated decision. And then they can, you know, make that final decision on there. And if they feel that's the right decision for them to make. So I really like that approach. I think uh, that's the right way to go, especially with uh, regenerative medicine and everything that you're working on to do with the person's mm -hmm. health and future and all of that as well. Now, I wanted to ask you uh, another question. This may be a bit of a stupid question. So I do apologize in advance. But I'm not clear on this, so I assume somebody else out there isn't clear on this either. Why is it that uh, we don't have all the same regulations and options for stem cells and PRP treatments and things of that, things of that nature here? Uh, because I know of a lot of people and even uh, people in my own network that go to uh, South America or other places to get uh, stem cell treatments mm -hmm. and whatnot. So what is the difference? What's going on in U.S. or Canada? Uh, why is that not available here? Yeah. So, so there, there is a regenerative treatments available in Ontario specifically. Um, the other, the other provinces, I don't know the specific regulations, but they, they limit it to like a PRP or platelet rich plasma. 
um, which is our you know uh, vein drawn. We take it out of the vein and we we process the sample and we inject it back into wherever we need to. Uh, there's there's definitely a lot of pushback when it comes to stem cell therapy where we extract it from the bone marrow. So a lot of patients, I, I actually just. Yeah, two weeks ago, I consulted someone from Toronto. Uh, to, next week, I have another patient from Toronto, who's, and we do these virtual consults like this, kind of similar to how you and I are, are, are talking. Right. And we do an assessment because they, they understand what the benefits are. There's enough published studies to support it. But there's a lot of regulation here because you're talking about utilization of you know, of your biologics your blood your bone marrow and if you come to our lab in our in our main office out in michigan shelby township we have a, a lab set up where we do everything under sterile techniques so we actually process the sample with the regulations and we have to get it certified and so i think that's the difference between the u.s and canada is yes fda approves the treatment but they don't advocate for it because it is considered experimental under many measures but but granted, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of published articles of the benefit of regenerative medicine on different areas of the body. Yet, nonetheless, if we're going to do it, it can be done, but it has to be done correctly. And so this is where a lot of the U.S. regulation is pushing. It's an investment. It's not cheap to put up your own lab, the, the hood, all of that costs money, and not a lot of physicians are ready to do it. Um, and in Canada... Uh, they, that, this is where the limitation is. This is where the, uh, the the restriction is, is that they don't allow for certain um, uh, pr biologics processing. And that's why a lot of these, these Canadians, even from Windsor, I have a number of Canadians that come to me into Michigan um, and they come for the day, they do the treatment and they go back. Um, and so... And, and so this is the biggest issue, I, I think. And it, it's probably not going to go away. Um, the other big uh, difference is, is in Canada, for example, even in the U.S., when we process these samples, we uh, historically we would have a machine at the bedside, and we basically take the patient's blood and we inject it into this machine, and it processes the sample and it comes out. And then we take that sample and inject it into the patient. But we're actually manually doing this preparation now, which which is not done probably probably maybe five percent at most of physicians that are doing regenerative medicine are doing this method. Uh, which is, I believe, the the better method, um, in in yielding higher and better results. So, so the, and the, again, that's going to that's an issue in setting up a lab in Ontario. You will not. That's all you know because it's all hospital based um, support. So you know, in hospital versus an outpatient clinic, we set it up in our outpatient clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, this is the biggest difference, I think, between Canada and the U.S. And that's why we see a lot of Canadians come over to us. Uh, because of the way we are able to do the processing, still safe um, and and more effective than than the traditional methods. Got it. So it's both a regulatory issue and a cost issue, which makes a lot of sense. Now, in, on yep. this uh, topic of uh, you doing it manually, what exactly does that entail, and how come it's more effective? When we do it through the lab manual separation, where we actually have a lab technician that does the separation of the cells from the product that we obtain from the patient, it yields 10 to 20 times more platelets or stem cells. So the yield wow. being higher allows for better outcomes. And, and it's funny because patients who understand this have read up on it. They come with this common knowledge that, you know, you guys do it in a way that's different than the doctor down the road because I don't want it to be processed, man, uh, pardon me, processed mechanically through a machine. I want it to be processed by human hands. It increases the eff efficacy of the of the product and the and the treatment. Um, and in the end, you, you get much happier patients. Um, I've seen I've been doing this since 2016, specifically regenerative. And I and I took on this new model two years ago. And I can tell you from 16 to two years ago versus two years ago to now, I've seen much better outcomes. Patients are much happier. And at least 80% or more patients are happier with the outcomes because of this method and this technique that we use. And, you know, I can't put it all on me. I mean, I think that if I did it versus a colleague of mine, we'll get the same outcomes. It's, just, it's the method of preparation. Sure. And one thing that I've already taken away from this, uh, from your mm -hmm. approach to uh, your clinics and to your work with your patients and everything that you do, uh, that I think any business owner, any entrepreneur, anybody in any industry can also take away is you're very much 
um, looking at the market and studying the market and then reverse engineering what you need to provide to cater to that market to really service the market um, at, the, at the best level possible. Even initially speaking, when you mentioned people were coming to you uh, and asking for these regenerative um, techniques, stem cells and PRP and things of that nature, and you you had to pivot your essentially what we would call a product line or a service line to uh, mm-hmm. cater to that. So I love that approach of looking at the market, seeing what the needs and demands are, and then looking at how you can provide that. I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs in the business space make the mistake mm-hmm. of trying to create this incredible product or service in their minds without ever going to market, without ever testing anything, um, and then being, uh, you know, experiencing that rude awakening and being very much disappointed that the results weren't there and their business is not able to grow or scale. So I just love that from an entrepreneurial perspective, how you always look at the market and then you uh, cater mm-hmm. to the market. And I think this manual technique is also part of that as well. Uh, you're really catering right. to what you know your patients need and want. Now, let's talk about uh, diversifying and uh, how that's helped you in your business and how, how that's helped you grow. And I know nowadays you're almost uh, being the shining example for other people in your field and they're looking at you and they're coming to you for advice on how they can sustain and grow their practices as well. So I'll let you tell us a bit more about how you've done that and how you think about diversifying. So I, I def- and and at some point, whenever you uh, feel it's appropriate, let's we, we'll touch base on the marketing aspect because this has been a huge eye opener for me as well. The marketing spend of a clinic, and I'll give you some insight on that. But not, but going sure. back to diversifying, um, so you know when when you know when i started practicing clinical medicine back in 2010 you know we, the, the the adage of kind of be the master of one trade um you know is is still present and prevalent but i realized that by doing so you're limiting your your patient slash clients that are walking through the door um, you know, so if I if I maintained a practice in traditional interventional pain, I would be really busy. Interventional pain is extremely busy, regardless. But the patient um, who walks in the door, there's a good opportunity and possibility that you're going to turn away, you know, fifty percent of them, or maybe maybe thirty, forty percent of them, because you don't offer something that they're looking for. And so when I when I looked at that, and I we you know we created. So I I used to be a consultant up until about 2021. So I I would consult my services to practices. So I, you know, and it was a very good business model. I had little to no overhead. I went in there, I did the treatment. It was amazing financially, but there was no brick and mortar for me to fall back on that. Hey, you know, when I turn 55 and I want to take a step back, how can I do that? And so that's why I really pursued my own or physical organization. I still do consulting, but we actually have a practice set up um, with with three satellite locations right now. And, you know, we have providers, etc. And so when I looked at this model and I got into it, I started, you know, started the office organization with a very, very linear path where I said, we're going to do interventional pain. And then, you know, then I, I started networking with um, LinkedIn and other different uh, uh, platforms, uh, groups and, and, and social networking events. And I realized that there's a lot more out there that we can offer as a as a clinician. And so when we talk about diversifying, I, I right now in my practice, we do interventional pain. I treat VA patients, veterans, mm-hmm. uh, where we do veteran evaluations. I do independent medical examinations for insurance companies that allow for a physician input, a secondary input as to you know, patient's condition. We do um, our own um uh, our own medication management, where we actually offer medications to patients on site, uh, and it's a convenience factor for them. Um, and and you know, and then I have a very strong program in uh, we call it personal injury or auto workman's comp. Um, and a lot of physicians. So I mean, j- right there, you're talking about six or seven service lines, and right there, you're, you're now taking what you would have done you know, and offering now multitude of services that you can still do and still be able to be successful. And so I realized that because because at some point the regulations may change, patient interests may change, the demographics may change, but you should be able to be prepared for it. I've, I've certified myself in interventional pain in probably about eight or nine different advanced interventional pain techniques that I can use for a patient. So when they ask me, I have specific requests to say, hey, Dr. Musabi, do you do this procedure? I say, yes, I do. Great. I'm going to send you a referral. Imagine if I hadn't 
diversified my skill set and my interests, I would have to turn that patient away. And when you turn one patient away, that referral source then almost like out of sight, out of mind. They then they're almost going to forget about you because they're going to say, you know, you can. So so even with the providers I brought on board, um, and and when I talk to them and, and we talk about diversifying, I, I I we we talk about training, we talk about advancing your skill set, doing different things, as because of this because I think it'll help grow your practice, and when you have multiple revenue streams, you're not putting your eggs in one basket, and I think that's huge because um, regulations change month to month, you know, if not year to year. Um, and, and, and so we, we see this and I think it better prepares us for it. So diversifying is key. Um, and, you know, I had, I had a, 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 a friend of mine who came over last night and just specifically to chat about, you know, her concern was, what do I do to diversify myself? I'm a physician. I work, I do a nine to five job. But what happens after nine to five? Where's my residual income or where's my, you know, where's my, where's my fallback? And so for me personally, if I, if I stop interventional pain management tomorrow, I have my regenerative medicine. I have my independent medical exams. I have my veteran exams. I have, you know, multiple facets that I can still fall back on. Let's just say Medicare, which is a regulating body in, in the U.S. says we're going to cut reimbursements by half and all the other insurance companies will follow suit we still have something to fall back on and not really have a major impact on our, on our financial stability. So I think for that reason, diversifying is key. Um, and at the same time, scaling from day one is key. I'm a, I'm a hard believer of it. There's many physicians that don't believe in it. Um, and they feel like, you know, they have to establish one location, one practice, and then scale after that. You miss the reason why I opened three satellites is because there are patients coming to me from different geographic areas in Michigan on multiple occasions. And I said, let me set up a satellite in those locations. And by doing so, my satellites are getting, the days I'm there are getting just as busy as our main location. So again, it's, it's the idea of diversifying and scaling from day one. And I think that, you know, we've been in practice for, our organization has been officially uh, open for about a year and a half now. Um, and I'm at a point on our, on our productivity perspective, where I have physician friends who have been open for six, seven years, and we're now equal head and head. So, and it took me, you know, two years ish to, to get to that point. But again, it's, it's because um, I kind of really looked into the business model, which honestly, I only really picked up in the last few years, because we're so narrow minded as physicians. Yeah, I love that. And clearly, you're defying yeah. the stereotype of being narrow minded as a physician, because you're very much uh, entrepreneurial as well. And looking at how you can grow and scale all of this. I didn't know, uh, by the way, that you did the consulting work beforehand as well. And you're still doing that on this on the side, I guess, because it's not main priority. Oh, yes. Um, yes. So that's uh, interesting to know. And it seems to me like the diversification side of things is just like any investments, you're diversifying to protect your business and to continue to uh, create more alternatives and options for yourself. Um, there was a saying, I think it was Peter Thiel. I'm not exactly sure if it was his quote, uh, but it's a pretty crude saying, which mm -hmm. was something along the lines of uh, specialization is for ants. And uh, he was a big fan of uh, <laughs> diversifying and uh, essentially having tentacles in different areas and uh, protecting yourself by having different layers mm -hmm. to your business and uh, all the rest. Now, of course, there's both sides to that. I, I know a lot of uh, people who specialize in different areas in the entrepreneurship space as well, and they do really well, at least to build their initial wealth, and then they diversify from there to maintain and uh, grow their wealth over time. But I think uh, it, it's really interesting to see you look at all of this through this lens of diversification and uh, sure. setting up all the different arms of the business as well. Now, you wanted to talk about the marketing side of things. What have you learned in the marketing process uh, as you're scaling all these different clinics? Oh, um, so that aspect, I think, was huge. And, and, I, and I talked to all my colleagues about it. When we started the practice, we were approached by multiple organizations to say, um, you know, you need this, you need SEO management, you need Google ads, you need on the ground marketing and et cetera, et cetera. And so initially we thought, oh, my, you know, the, the spend is so high. Like, how do we do it? Like, how do we afford it? And in retrospect, now that I, when I talk to colleagues of mine who come to me and, and we just have chit chat about, you know, how the practices are grown, I tell them off the bat, have a significant allocation of funds for marketing. 
I think because of our marketing, our spend that we've done, pretty much we opened doors in more or less June of 2022. We started our, our, our full marketing program in August, and pardon me, July, um, where we took on a, a, a firm to handle all of our SEO management and, and you know, different various platforms. And then in September, uh, we took on an on-the-ground marketing firm to do our uh, you know door-to-door marketing it has changed. I mean, we, we get, you know, 20 referrals a week, you know, at, at, you know, and, and in our world, that's, that's a pretty decent number. Some, you know, sometimes more than that. So Mm -hmm. the big thing is, is we're, we're always so, you know, with, we have the adage in our mind that, you know, if you build it, they'll come it, meaning if you open doors, patients are going to flood the gates. It doesn't happen. You need the, you need that spend, to get to that point. And, and I think because we allocated that amount and it's a significant amount monthly, um, we were able to get to the point where we're at quicker than a lot of uh, my colleagues who have been open for many more years um, because of the fact that we realized that, you know, if you don't market yourself, if you, if you don't do these kind of interactions and discussions, um, and, you know, it's similar to what you and I are doing today, it, it it makes it very um, very challenging um, um, to to grow. Uh, I was approached uh, probably about six months ago by a, by a producer from CBS um, and uh, in in the United States and Michigan, and you know and he he selected three clinics in each specialty, and we were one of the clinics because he liked our Google um, uh, reviews, he liked our uh, website, and so they did a little bit of background check before they called these pain visit, pain clinics. So I got a call and um, and it was around four o'clock in the evening and, you know, and, and my one of my staff came to me and said, this is a you know person from this, you know, a TV network and, you know, a producer from there and so on and so forth. So I said, OK, it's, it's probably some type of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, some type of uh, soliciting. So I said, OK, but you know what, let me let me entertain it. And I called them back. I called him back and within 30 seconds of the conversation, this is what he told me. He's like, listen, Dr. Musabi. What I'm going to offer you, you have to spend money on, you have to dedicate time on, and it's not going to be cheap. Before we move on and I spend time speaking to you, are you a physician that's open to this? That's literally how we started the conversation. Really nice guy. I said, absolutely. Because by then, I was seven, eight months into it. So I understood marketing was really important. Spending on it was really important. And he started the conversation that this is my role. We have a, a show on CBS. It airs, you know, before and after football, this and that. And he was, he was going into detail about all this. And I said, sign me up. So I was the first pain clinic out of the three that he called, that his assistant called. And I called him back. And right away, he's like, if you're in, I'm going to, if the other two call me back, I'm not going to take the answer. But but the point I'm making is that understanding, he, even he, his perspective is we're so narrow-minded that we don't want to spend money on other than anything other than our billers, our staff, and maybe a little bit of brochures here and there that, that he, he, he felt me out to say that, are you in it for the long run? Or are you just going to say, this is too much money, please go ahead and move on to the next doctor. And right. so this is the mentality, I think, that even even outsiders are seeing us. And I think we have to change that. And, and, I, and I believe that because of this mentality shift, we're seeing a lot more growth opportunity, especially with newer physicians that are coming in the market. Yes, you have to have money aside to do this. It's like I said, it's it's not cheap. It can go, you know, 10K or higher per month just to do your marketing. Um, forget even anything else. But at the end of the day, the return on that investment can double or triple. And so, so this is the key when it comes to marketing. So I tell, you know, because when I tell my marketing spend to a lot of my colleagues, they're like in shock. They're like, How, why would you spend so much on marketing? I said, well, look where I am now after a year and a half and look where you are in seven years, eight years, 10 years, right? We're almost mm-hmm. equal now, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. Absolutely. It's definitely the way to speed up that process, which is why your results are there in such a shorter time span. Um, I love that the producer from CBS asked you some direct qualifying questions. He was obviously a great sales guy because that's what, uh, that's yeah, what yeah. we call qualifying well, questions to, to get those answers. I should correct myself. He's, he wasn't directly from CBS. He was a producer for a show that they had an airtime on CBS. That I, I should correct myself. But but nonetheless, I mean, you know, we aired twice in uh, once in October, once in November. Um, and, you know, it's it pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty neat. 
Yeah, absolutely. We'll put it in the show notes. Everybody can watch that as well. And uh, I just said, it sounds like, you know, it's uh, it was worth the investment as well. So I'm glad you yeah, uh, made that was. decision. I think it was. Yeah, for sure. Okay, awesome. Yeah, on the marketing side, uh, I have a good friend as well who uh, runs a lot of ads and does a lot in the uh, uh, health supplement side of things. And uh, he always says, if you can't spend minimum 50000 a month on uh, your marketing, your ad spend, don't even start. So he will, he has a belief that you have to start at that level. So there definitely I mean, is. I'll get uh, there hopefully soon. But yeah, no, I, I yeah. agree with it. I agree with it. There's no limit. Yeah. And, you know, marketing and sales are what make the business. That's that's what makes a business a business. Otherwise, you have a hobby. You don't have a business, right? So I think exactly. whenever you invest into marketing and sales and getting your message, your services in front of people mm -hmm. and gathering eyeballs, which is the ultimate currency nowadays, uh, it's definitely worth it. And that's how you exactly. grow and scale. So it, it's amazing to see. Exactly. Um, I wanted to go back to your actual work and your field of study and, and what you do and ask you a okay. question that I'm curious about. With all of your experience mm -hmm. nowadays and all the patients that you see in the direction of pain management and uh, stem mm -hmm. cells and regenerative medicine and everything else, do you would you recommend any type of uh, preventative measures to uh, everybody listening? I mean, if we're looking to avoid um, general health issues, pain related mm -hmm. issues and whatnot. I have a couple injuries myself. I actually just sure. unfortunately re injured my knee last week again. Uh, so I'm mm -hmm. handling that now, but you know, do you have any specific uh, advice for anybody who'd be interested in preventative measures? Great, great question. So I have a, a number of colleagues, friends, associates out here in Windsor. I mean, I have many in the U S too, um, that have approached me about this and say, you know, um, you know, I play soccer every day or I, or, or I do circuit training or I weight lift or I do a lot of, uh, you know, exercises, et cetera, et cetera, running, jogging, all the above. You know, I have a little discomfort here and there. I'll scan them. I'll, I'll bring them to my practice. We'll do an evaluation. I'll do an MRI or, you know, whatever the appropriate scan is for that person. And we'll, we'll reveal some type of pathology. So I tell them, listen, it's, it's one of two things that you can do. When you talk about preventative the, the the true preventative method is just not do it anymore. But how realistic is that, right? I mean, I have a right. you know fifty year old colleague, fifty five, I think he is, and he does he plays soccer avidly, and um and he's got bilateral knee both sides knee pain, and I did the MRIs and it shows meniscus tears. He could live with those tears, but eventually, when he's sixty or maybe even sooner, those tears are going to progress and get worse. So how do you prevent that from happening? This is where the whole regenerative medicine comes in. And this is where we're advocating it. So I see young patients in their 40s with horrible spines. I do their MRI because they have a little bit of back pain. But I explain to them, you're 42. Maybe by the age of 45 or 50, that little bit's going to be moderate and maybe even severe. So then at that point, what do you do? Even the regenerative treatments may not help you at that point. So from a preventative model, this is what I'm advocating to, pe to patients and clients that we see is you have pain, let's assess an eval. If we can catch and repair and restore that part of your body before it gets worse, so you need surgical intervention, this is the time to do it. Don't come to me when your pain is 10 out of 10. And at that point, I'm going to tell you that if I do regenerative, it may or may not help. You know, and, and so, mm -hmm. so the preventative aspect, yes, the lifestyle modifications, weight management, diet, these are all important. Um, you know, vitamin supplements, et cetera, stretching before exercising, et cetera, et cetera. But from a, from a structural point of view or mechanical point of view, I find that advocating the regenerative aspect is huge. And I, I've been seeing in the next month, I have patients coming to me from Windsor and, and Canada and, and Michigan who are in mild pain. But they, we reveal pathology on their imaging and they don't want it to get severe or even moderately severe. So they're coming in for the regenerative treatments. You know, I have patients who get their regenerative treatments done three or four years ago, before. And then, you know, time goes on. Degeneration still continues. You're still active. You're still maintaining some uh, high level, um, uh, you know, activity. And, you know, you may get repeat or recurrent pain in three years. They come in for another treatment. Rather than let me sit on it, I spent money on it three years ago, but versus mm -hmm. they see it as an investment in their health, you know, mm -hmm. because even post-surgical recovery can be much more significant. So, so from a preventative point of view, lifestyle management, absolutely. But for those who actually come in, but majority of us have some type of ache and pain, 
when they come in and we reveal that, I tell them nip it in the bud before it gets worse. And this is what we're advocating now. And a lot of patients are seeing that. They're seeing it, they're doing it. And, um, and, and, and it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, um, uh, thing because when I, when I treat them as a pre preventative measure before it gets worse, we see much better outcomes. And, you know, and, and I tell patients, I'll, you know, I'll say that I'll treat you, you know, today I'll, I'll consult you in a couple of weeks, see how you do. I'll consult you again in about two months. And after that, I don't want to see you, you know, I don't, you don't have to come right. back to me, hopefully for years and years. And so that, that mm -hmm. idea is very, um, uh, uplifting for them. And so. But it's hard. It's a hard sell when you talk about a 40 year old and you talk about, oh, my God, mm -hmm. I need a treatment. Well, yeah, because when you're 50, you're going to need surgery. And so we try and prevent that. And so it's education as well as awareness that that is key for that for that. Yeah, and I agree. I think I think the education piece is really important because I was just about to say it's becoming less and less of a hard sell. Because I'm telling you from yeah. my own perspective, you know, I'm very young and I'm definitely not 40 yet. And I'm very much considering some of these uh, regenerative practices. And I, I want to almost get ahead of the game and um, almost even as, as a health benefit, because I'm always looking at as much as the ward doesn't do it justice, but I'll say it anyways, biohacking and uh, looking to uh, really mm -hmm. be optimal, whether it's uh, from a cognitive perspective, whether it's from a physical performance perspective, because I do play sports and martial arts mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. as well. So I'm looking to optimize yeah, myself and also for, for business, absolutely. for conversations like this, uh, you know, to be operating at your best. So for somebody like myself, and I think that's a lot of people nowadays with the explosion of podcasts and information and health educators like yourself now, um, I think it's becoming more and more prevalent where we're actually looking to get ahead of this. And, uh, you know, I may have a couple aching injuries and, and minor injuries. It's nothing serious, but I already want to get ahead of the game and uh, start doing some stem cells and start doing some PRP and whatever else it may be. So I'll definitely talk to you more about that offline. But the reason sure. I'm asking this and, and saying all this as well is uh, my next question was, is there an age limit? I'm not aware of this. Is there a time frame where you would recommend uh, somebody start to take on these practices? I've treated 13 year old soccer player with a gastroc tear to wow. a 74 year old hip. Uh, recently, you talk about martial arts. I recently treated a jujitsu fighter. He had a, a, a lateral collateral ligament tear of his knee fighting. He was in a tournament mm -hmm. and he injured it. And surgically, he was told he needs surgery. He, he educated himself. He found us. He called me. He did bone marrow. He was almost 90% better with that injury three months, or pardon me, three. Uh, three months into the treatment. So prior to that, he was, he was already sparring again, etc. He injured his right knee. And based on his experience, he came back to me six months later for his right knee. Fortunately, his right knee was just a strain, so we didn't have to treat it. But mm -hmm. the idea of catching it, and he was 33, I think, 34. So, you know, the, the, they can be young, they can, re, re, you know, and, and very old. So there really isn't a time frame. It's a matter of identifying if you're a good candidate. And if you are, then absolutely. It's your own body's ability to heal. So no, it doesn't matter if you're 10 years old, not that I've treated one, but if versus 75 year old, if your body has a capacity to continue to heal, we can take that and redirect it in the area that's damaged or injured. And that's the whole kind of understanding of how this whole regenerative process works. Got it. So again, follow up on this question, because I'm just personally very curious. If somebody mm -hmm. does come to you and let's say they lean on the younger side and there aren't very clear issues that need to be addressed immediately, but they're telling you essentially they want to get ahead of the game and they want to optimize mm -hmm. their performance and uh, maybe get rid of some uh, you know, small injuries and whatnot, uh, would there ever be a case where you would turn down a patient or is there essentially no harm in uh, doing these uh, practices at any time? Great question. I've definitely turned down patients, especially the younger ones. I had a, a basketball player, high school basketball player who was already drafted, went, was going college. He got a scholarship and everything. And he had recurrent ankle pain. We did an MRI. There's no pathology. There's a little bit of tendonitis. Um, and so my options for him was, listen, let me treat you with, uh, you know, some therapy, a little bit of uh, steroid therapy, anti-inflammatory. And if it because they came in with PRP in mind, they're like, we want to do this. This is what we read up on it. This athlete did it. That athlete did it. And I redirected them. And actually, it, it worked for him where we didn't have to do the PRP. We did the traditional treatments and he got better. So the point is, is every now let's just say the dad and the son together, he was 18, but nonetheless, the dad was involved or he was 17. But 
if, if they really push for me and, and said, Dr. Masavi, we, we understand that it may not work, et cetera, et cetera. And they're paying out of pocket for it, right? The beauty of PRP is no harm, no foul. It's your own body's biologic. We're processing it. We're re-injecting it. We're not putting anything foreign. There's no chance of reactivities and no chance of allergic reaction. There's no chance of really major complications. Um, any interventional technique we do, we always penetrate the skin. So obviously there's always a risk of bleeding, allergic reaction and infection with the stuff we use to clean the area and et cetera. So that's common, whether I do regenerative or traditional pain treatments. Um, but that's the nice thing is, is as I kind of go back to that patient who wanted his lumbar spine treated after three visits, we went right back to it because he understood what he wanted. Is there any harm for me to do it? Absolutely not. It's probably safer in some ways to do this rather than injecting corticosteroid, for example, into someone. And so we're pulling away from that whole mentality. And when I engage with the patient, I tell them very, very much off the bat that, listen, there's no harm, no foul to this. Our techniques are safe. How we do it, it's all image guided. We use x-ray, we use ultrasound to, to place the the, uh, the sample into the area that we're treating. But at the end of the day, it really won't do you any harm. And, and so with that mentality in mind, a lot of them are like, you know what, I want to try it. I'd rather not do surgery. I want to try it, et cetera. So yeah, that's a nice thing. But I do turn patients away because that's all my own principle. Uh, because if I, if I feel like they're too far gone, I won't. I'll tell them, don't spend your money on this. I don't think it's going to help. If they're too young or if the symptom is not clinical, like the jujitsu fighter who came in for his right knee and he was like, I want to do it, doc, I'm ready. And and um, I told him, no, I said, no, I think we should do traditional. And I'm happy I did because he did decent after just from therapy, a little bit of stretching, rec you know, recovery time. So every patient we treat individually, regardless of age. Uh, but education and, and following the principle of doing what's best for the patient is, is I think, key. Yeah, that's understandable. And uh, it makes a lot of sense. You're following your own moral code, essentially, to make sure you're practicing in an ethical way and uh, guiding them in the best direction for them. But again, this is all very curious for me because I'm very much yeah. personally interested. Uh, but I, again, I haven't had any type of surgeries before for uh, injuries, mm -hmm. thankfully. So mm -hmm. I haven't... Uh, gotten to that extreme at least not yet uh but i'm very much active and there are very much nagging uh little injuries that i do want to get in front of and handle so i wanted to clarify all of that and for anybody who's listening who's in the same shoes as i am especially like you said a lot of jiu-jitsu fighters mma fighters uh nowadays i have a lot of them in my own network and friend group and uh, we've had a couple mm -hmm. of fighters including a ufc fighter on this podcast as well and uh, i know mm -hmm. they deal with a lot of this and i know they're constantly looking for uh you know regenerative or pain uh, treatments. And uh, there are a couple of uh, clinic actually oh, yeah. uh, in, in this area as well that uh, a bunch of the fighters go to. So I know it's, a, it's very much top of mind always. Now, as we look into the future, I'm curious as to what your thoughts on this are. There are a lot of technologies, including, of course, artificial intelligence and uh, AGI mm -hmm. developing and everything else coming into all these different industries. And we're seeing it in the online space, in the business realm. Uh, and disrupting a lot of different industries, um, a lot of ways helping, but also in a lot of ways uh, disrupting and not necessarily in a negative sense of the word, but just changing the trajectory or the path that these industries are taking. Has uh, this technology or AI or uh, everything that has been happening affected your industry at all? And also, where do you see it going and how do you see yourself incorporating all of this? Um, good question. Um, and so I can tell you right now, I have a very strong interest in this aspect of the industry. I think that we can improve uh, efficiency. I think we can minimize medical errors. I think we can um, um, help uh, practices with overhead costs with with this type of um, you know advancement in how we organize ourselves. AI, um, I'm actually talking to a few organizations right now who do um, uh, you know have some strong interest in it as well and um, and, and and so I, I definitely believe that it's going to be a, a game changer um, I think that there is a, there is a place you know there's a lot of recurrent um, thinking recurrent um, treatment uh, protocols etc that I think we can implement utilizing some of these technologies um, and not necessarily have to uh, you know re, you know be redundant rather than that we can be efficient um and so i believe ai is going to be huge i know there's going to be a lot of work being done right now i know i have a strong interest in it and i'm probably pursuing that aspect of it 
another aspect of diversifying myself, but, but I think that there is definitely a big uh, element to this. Um, and specifically uh, within clinics, um, I don't, I don't, you know, hospital networks obviously is going to be a bigger, a bigger um, uh, modification that's going to be needed, but I think private clinics can really implement it. Um, and I think it, it'll, it'll, you know, hugely impact efficiency and overhead costs. So um, I see it being a positive, um, you know, for documentation purposes, for efficiency purposes, um, and, you know, again, to minimize some of these, uh, you know, and, and to be honest, to minimize physician burnout. I think that all the, the things we have to do from the notes, from the constant uh, documentation, I think it pushes us, you know, at the end of the day, I, I had I met the same colleague of mine was saying that, you know, she sees 30 patients during the day, but she doesn't have time to do the notes. And then she sits mm-hmm. at home or the next day to do 30 notes, you know, it's like, and it's not easy, believe me, to do these notes when you're at home. Yeah, that, that's near impossible. Is- Sorry to yeah. cut you off. I was just going to say, no. I do a lot of meetings throughout the day and I've tried this before where, you know, I may miss out on yeah. notes and whatnot. And then at the end of the day, think back to those we conversations can. and try to recoup everything. But uh, so, unfortunately, our, our brains are just not that good. Our memories are not that good. No. And I think this is where AI is going to come in to really help that process where we can, you still spend the same amount of time with the patient, but rather than having to document and type or having a staff member in the room doing the same thing, you can actually engage with the patient, talk to them, find out more about their concerns and let the computer technology do all the documentation for you. And so I, I think this, I think it's huge. I have a very strong interest in it and maybe that might be another podcast on a separate day. <laughs> For maybe sure. Who yeah. knows where it's going to go, but yeah. We're going to have to uh, revisit this yeah. and uh, you might be speaking to uh, an AGI instead of me on that podcast. We'll see. We'll see where it all develops. <laughs> but uh, the sure. reason I ask is because you have that strong interest and uh, mindset around diversifying yourself and uh, essentially bulletproofing your business model. And uh, you've done a great job with that so far. And earlier in the conversation, you Thanks. mentioned Dr. Google and uh, now yeah. Dr. AI is definitely going to be uh, exactly. a big Absolutely. player in, in this space, just like in any other space. Mm-hmm. So generally mm-hmm. speaking, are you more excited or more nervous about uh, the development of AI and everything and where it's all, all headed? Personally, I'm more excited because I think that as with any technology, look, we, we, we have to combat Dr. Google, right? Patients yeah. came to me with this. This is what I read. This is what, and, and then you, you, you spend the time explaining that, no, this is your misconception or you're right. And let's incorporate that into your treatment plan. So I think it can go both ways. I think with AI, it's the same thing. I think it, I think it can go both ways, but you, we have to understand what the technology is. Like for me not to be able to Google, you know, stuff and find out what the patients are seeing, I wouldn't be able to address it. But so I educated myself on that. And I think it's the same way as AI. If we educate ourselves, I think we can combat any possible negative repercussions that may come out of it. But I think it's definitely important um, because I think I know it's going to improve efficiency. I mean, I, you know, my, my staff is, I don't want them to burn out either. And so this is, for me, it's important that, you know, we create other ways and means to help, um, uh, develop these strategies to improve efficiency yet not have to cut back on our patient time and, or our volumes. Well, I love your optimistic take on everything, which is, it's, it's great. I think an optimistic point of view is, is the way to, really yeah. grow and, and develop anything in life because your outlook determines your outcome. So uh, when you're more optimistic, you're just uh, more willing to look at opportunities as opposed to look at you know the challenges or really? obstacles that may arise as a result. So I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I want to wrap this up with a final question that I ask everybody. Sure. With all of your expertise in different areas and uh, with your mindset and how you really calculate everything in terms of these different aspects of the business. I'm curious to hear your answer. It's a very open-ended question. So you mm-hmm. can feel free to take it wherever you like it, but I'm genuinely curious to hear just your thought process. And uh, yeah. this question came from when I was younger and going to a lot of business conferences and meeting a lot of uh, people that I looked up to at the time. And mm-hmm. I would ask them all the exact same question. And uh, depending on what age I was, I was just substitute the number and I would take their advice and essentially apply it. And uh, I took the good, left the bad, as Bruce Lee says, and uh, right. tried to see the result in my life. So the question mm-hmm. is, knowing everything you know today and the person that you are today, if you could go back to your younger self, and I know that you have kids, so a helpful way of looking at this may be thinking about talking to your kids. If you could go back to your younger self and give yourself only one piece of advice, what would that be? So it's it's uh 
the, there's probably many things on my mind, but I think at the end of the day, plan your life where you can enjoy it. For, you know, business work are always going to be there, but plan your life where you can, where you foresee a, a nice steady balance. Um, and I think that's where my focus is right now is I want to, I'm planning my current organization. So in the next three to four years, I have a, a great balance with my personal life and my business life. Um, and I think that's key. I think that's key because, you know, all of us can be workaholics. Um, and I, you know, and I think, you know, it's an excuse, but I think that, you know, my awareness more recently has been that if I go, if I, if I go back 10 years, even from 2010, I would have started my own practice because I have my own autonomy, my own control, you know, and yes, it would have been a financial strain, but you know what? I would be sitting here a decade later, probably with, you know, multiple practices with multiple providers, and I could be going on a one month vacation with my family. Right. So plan your life. I think that where you can have a, have a balance. And so that's what I would, that's what I would have done differently. And, and I'm, and I'm doing it now, but that's what I would educate my kids on is, you know, have a balance nine to five. When you come home, do your best not to do any work and just enjoy life. That's great advice. I love that. And I think that's a beautiful place to wrap up. Say, thank you so much yeah, for being here today. For sure. I learned a lot in this conversation, uh, both on uh, a yeah. medical perspective and from your areas of expertise and also from the business side of things with uh, really prioritizing marketing, prioritizing scale and rapidly scaling in all directions, uh, bulletproofing your business model and really taking care of uh, all of your priorities so that later you could live uh, a happier, more balanced life and essentially take yourself out of the business and have just as much impact, but also enjoy the fruits of your labor. So I've Absolutely. learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else has as well. Thank you so much again for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you.